Well, hello there everyone, I'm UXW Bill, and you've tuned in to another highly exciting video of mine, or at least I sincerely hope that's what it will be. You see, last night, for the first time in 23 odd years, the good old comfort shaker laid down and died. I don't know exactly what's wrong with it yet, but that's what we're going to find out during the course of this video. What I do know for sure is that one of the two cartridge fuses in the disconnect had blown. It hadn't blown violently, so I don't think there's been a major failure of the condensing unit. But as I say, that's what we're going to find out. Now, I could, and in a lot of circumstances, probably would just go ahead and throw the replacement fuses in there and go again. But it turns out that at the local hardware emporium, these are seven and a half dollars a piece. And I don't really feel like spending that much on replacement fuses if there is something wrong with this unit. Plus, as a budding HVAC service technician of some description, I should probably go through and take a look at the unit's internals. But for the past 23 years, I want to reiterate, this thing has been faultlessly reliable throughout all those brutal Illinois summers. Even though it's a little bit undersized to this house, if my recollection is correct, and I believe that it is, it has done very, very well. I know a lot has changed since we bought this unit, but I would buy another comfort maker again. It has done very well by me. I have absolutely no complaints with its performance. But as such, that means that no one has ever even looked inside the electrical compartment on this thing to check out the contactor or the start and run capacitor or anything else. And yes, I did clean this before the cooling season started. I don't know what kind of pernicious tree has appeared around here that has resulted in this getting all plugged up again. I've never seen that in any previous year, so I'm guessing that somewhere around here someone's planted a new tree that emits some sort of a noxious fiber that air conditioning units suck up and then become hopelessly plugged by. I'll probably go ahead and back flush it with a hose before I put it back into service. But let's go ahead and get that electrical box open and see what might be inside there. And again, since it's never been opened, I figure there probably could be something dangerous in there, like maybe huge insects with large glands or something from the planet Klaxon. Well, it's definitely looking a little furry in there, though certainly nothing like as bad as I might have expected. And I'm very pleased to see that there are no animals in here. Things like snakes and mice, even rats, are not unheard of about getting into condensing units and outdoor heat pump coils and things like that. And usually they die after they bite off a little more electricity than they can chew. And speaking of electricity, one thing we want to do, I just want to make sure, even though the disconnect is out, that there isn't actually any electrical power present in here. There certainly shouldn't be, but as the old saying goes, an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I, have been, I haven't been lit up in a while, and I really don't want to be, so... <laughs> I'll go ahead and see if I can actually do this single-handed, where the power comes into the contactor here. And yeah, there's basically nothing. One volt. I'd call that a phantom voltage, and I would be willing to bet that if I switched this meter to its low Z range, in an effort to load that phantom voltage down, that it would probably go away. Indeed it did. So we're definitely cold and dead out here. And I have no reason to doubt this disconnect. But in watching YouTube videos of various and sundry people servicing these things, I, as well as listening to my instructors in my class, I have learned that you just you don't take this kind of thing for granted because it, it's literally a matter of life and death. And I just watched a video today, in fact, where somebody thought the unit was dead, went ahead and changed a capacitor in it, and almost did get lit up. I, I will say one thing though, and, and I don't mean to inappropriately criticize guys who've been playing this game for years, but one thing that, that absolutely horrifies me, I mean it mortifies me when I see people doing this, I see guys that are evidently married or at least wearing a ring of some description, whatever kind of a ring it is, you should never ever ever wear a ring when you're working inside one of these units that's potentially energized, and the reason is very simple. If you were to reach in here and touch across something that was live and something that was grounded with your ring, your ring would become part of that electrical circuit and it would get very, very hot very, very quickly. 
And what that will serve to do, that will cauterize whatever finger you're wearing that ring on. In other words, it burns all the blood vessels, and if you kill off the blood supply to a portion of your body, you're going to lose it. Not to mention the possibility for all sorts of fun stuff like arc flash. So, if you're wearing a ring, take it off before you ever start working on something like this, because the, the limb you save could very well be, be your own. Anyway, let's go ahead and clean this up and see if we can get a better look at the condition of the contacts on that contactor. They, they look okay to me in a preliminary glance. I don't think they're too badly cooked, especially for as old as this thing is, but I want to clean it up so I can see a little bit better. And oh, by the way, since I'm sure some clever clogs in the viewing audience is going to call me on this, to make a complete voltage check at the outdoor unit to make sure that everything is dead, especially if one of the two fuses protecting it has blown, you need to go not only between the two legs of power, you also need to go between each leg of power and ground. And if you're not sure you can trust the ground in the unit, drive a metal rod, a piece of copper pipe into the ground, you know, drive it in about a foot or two in most places with average soil types, run a wire to that, and you can use that as your ground reference while you check for power on either side of these. So don't just check across these two contacts, check across them by themselves between each one and ground. Okay, we're back, and what I'm doing now is I'm actually looking at the secondary or load side of the contactor just to see if there might be any possibility of a grounded compressor or a grounded outdoor fan motor. I've got one meter lead over here pretty securely connected to the ground. And I've actually got my multimeter in its continuity test range just to verify that I do in fact have a good connection to ground. And it beeps, so I do. We'll put it back in its normal resistance testing range because the continuity testing range is usually fairly limited as far as, far as how much resistance it can test for. And what we're looking for here ideally would be several mega ohms worth of resistance as we have or even an open line as the meter finally settled down and indicated, which is a good sign. It would tend to suggest that the compressor in this thing is perfectly fine. Not that I expected any differently. I'll show you the blown fuse and I think you'll agree that it just blew from fatigue, years and years of thermal cycling. Because as these things operate, these fuses heat up and cool down to a certain degree. So here I've gone ahead and liberated the capacitor from its mounting bracket in order to test it. These are the ratings, made in late 1995, the 50th week, so this unit's actually a little newer than I thought it was. It's a 40 plus 5, rated for 440 volts, so we'll put the multimeter in its capacitor testing range. I shot past it there, there we go. All right, I'm back yet again, and I've gone ahead and made the tests on this capacitor. I wasn't making particularly good electrical contact. What I've discovered is that the fan side of this split capacitor is good. It reads about 3.99 microfarads out of 4. I'd call that more than close enough. <laughs> Certainly well within the realm of uh, acceptable margin of error. Probably exceeds the accuracy of my test instrument. The compressor side of things, though, is a little bit weak. It read 37 microfarads when it's supposed to be at 40, so I reckon I'll probably go ahead and replace this. I will say that I am not one of those people who puts 100% um, faith in a multimeter's capacitor testing range, because it doesn't test the capacitor under anything like its normal working conditions. The ultimate test of a capacitor is how well it actually performs under a full, real load in a circuit. In looking at the condition of the electrical contacts on the contactor, and this is just a single pole contactor, so it only interrupts one side of the line, I do think there's probably an argument to be made for replacing this. Let's see if I can show it to you. It's definitely looking pretty pitted in there. I can't really see the other one very well, but maybe the scanning electron handycam can get a better view of it than I can. Yeah, they both look pretty bruised, so I think I'm going to suggest that not only should that capacitor be replaced, because capacitors are cheap and might as well throw one on there if it's a little bit weak on the compressor side of things, but I'm going to throw a contactor on there as well. Here's the data plate, both for my own subsequent reference when it comes time to order parts. 
but also for anyone who's curious about exactly what kind of a comfort shaker this happens to be and approximately how old it is. And again, I think it's probably newer than I thought because the serial number begins with 9601. So if I'm reading that right, it'd be the first week of the year 1996. It's still done very, very well, though. <clears throat> All right, so I went ahead and talked the situation over with my parents, told them what I thought the unit needs, and they want me to go ahead and see if it'll run with a replacement set of fuses, and it's pretty hard to say no. So we should know almost instantly if the thing will start up and run. It took right off. There's something making a little squeaky noise. Of course, several of the panels are kind of loose on this thing, so <laughs> I shouldn't judge it too strictly before I put it all the way back together. There's your crazy idea of the day, and no, you should never do this. <laughs> but this house next door is completely vacant, and over there is a very similar vintage comfort shaker. Might be the perfect source for parts if I need any. <laughs> but we're still running along very well over here. I would say that the current draw figure looks a little bit low at about 15.2, 15.3 amps. But I temper that by saying this is a fairly cool day. This thing couldn't have picked a better time to fail. Sure, it's still a bit humid out here, but I'd say the temperature's somewhere around 78, 79 degrees, so this thing's not having to work too hard. Getting nice warm air out of the top of it. And if we look at our specifications here for the Copeland compressor, you can see that the running load amps, that would be the full load amps. I believe I'm correct in equating the two. I'm sure that if I'm not, I'll get caned about it in the comments. Is given as 18.6. I know about a year ago when I had a clamp meter on this thing during a very hot day, I saw it pulling somewhere around 20 amps worth of current per leg, and they're pretty evenly matched. There's just the tiniest little bit of difference between the two if we go over here to this other leg of power. It's a little bit lower, but not so much that I'm actually inclined to worry about it. In other words, I think this thing's probably going to be all right. This capacitor's staying nice and cool. So for now, I guess I'll put it back together, and we'll get those replacement parts ordered up. Figure out somewhere to get them. I don't know that there's a supply house in the world that'll sell to me right now. But um, we'll, we'll take it from there. There'll probably be a part two to this video. In the meantime, I certainly do thank you for watching, and as always, I welcome your constructive commentary. And I guess I'll, throw a, I'll go ahead and throw a postscript on here. There are probably some people wondering why I haven't gone ahead and gauged up on this thing to check the charge. And the reason is very simple. I'm a little bit gun-shy about doing that on a 22-year-old unit whose service ports have never been touched. If this thing should decide that it's not going to reseal after I take my gauge set off of there, I don't have any more Refrigerant 22 to recharge it with, and right now that's just not in my budget to get some. And I don't want to go through changing this thing over to use one of the substitute refrigerants for a 22 system. It's working well, the Delta T looks good, it cools down the house, cuts the humidity, seems to be doing everything it's supposed to, and it's a personally owned and operated unit. I'm right here if it ever goes wrong again. So I'm going to leave it at that. Some people might disagree with that, and that's certainly their prerogative, but it's all a matter of opinion eventually, and my opinion is that I shouldn't tempt fate by messing around with that, because it has happened to me. I was working on a Mitsubishi ductless mini-split unit, in the HVAC lab when I was still attending my classes. Got it all charged to spec, took my service hoses off of there and it's going straight out the service valve. Just enough to let the panic really gel, just enough to make you feel like you're about two millimeters tall. <laughs> so I screwed the hose right back on there as fast as I could, recovered the remaining charge, replaced the Schrader core and went again and everything was fine. But that was with a 410A system, and there was plenty of 410A in the classroom. This is a different story entirely, so I'm just not going to tempt fate here. Well, there we go. I think it ought to be a lot happier now than it was. The coil is certainly a thousand times cleaner than it was. 
Probably still ought to go over it with some kind of proper coil cleaner of some kind. Let's just go ahead and see if it'll start up once again. So I almost forgot to include what's probably the most important part of this entire video, and that's discussion and dissection of the failed fuse. So those of you who thought you were going to get off easy with a short little UXW bill video, nope, not going to happen unless, of course, you stop watching right now. This is the still surviving fuse. I went ahead and replaced them as a pair because I figure if I don't, the other one has probably been similarly stressed over the years. and. It's just not worth it. You're not saving that much money, especially when you have to put up with the irritation of the thing going out again. But here's the dissected remains of the fuse that I took apart. And many of these fuses are actually filled with a very high-grade quartz sand. You can actually see some of the sand particles resting here on my pool table workbench right now. These have a couple of purposes. First of all, they serve to absorb an explosion in the event that a major failure like a hard short circuit downstream of the fuse takes place. They also serve to help quench the arc. Now if we take a look at the blade inside this fuse, the filament, although I know that's not really the right term for it, and I wish the camcorder would decide to focus on this, I really do, but it's not, not willing to do so. Someday this camcorder is going to get replaced. <laughs> I'm already thinking about doing exactly that. So we'll try to put it up close and personal, and no, it's just not going to happen for some reason. Supposedly you can touch the screen on this thing to tell it to focus in a given area, but it won't even do it then. I usually have to nudge the zoom button a little bit to convince it that I mean business, and I'm not sure what sort of failure that would represent. Okay, digression. It is slowly starting to come into focus. You can actually see how there might have been a little bitty explosion when the blade actually failed. I'd say there's some material missing from inside this fuse. But you can also see how some of the sand that was inside it actually melted to the blade inside the fuse, the, the filament inside the fuse. It got so hot that the sand actually fused itself to the metal body. And I don't think that's really supposed to happen when these blow, but I don't know how it could avoid happening because the temperatures are quite high. These things do get a little bit warm in the normal course of operation. And when a failure actually occurs, they can blow apart violently. I've seen that happen too. And that's what the sand is supposed to prevent. So that's one end of it. We'll get the other one up here, hopefully before this camcorder changes its mind and decides to focus on something else. There you can see some more boogers, and isn't that a technical term of sand that fused themselves to the metal wire inside there. See, the focus just shifted, just like that. <laughs> so there you go, folks. That's how the fuse failed. I don't think that it was anything more than old age that contributed to the failure. Just constant stress of thermal cycling that ultimately caught up with things. I know this video needs to be wrapped up, but take a moment and check this out. Look at this brave little guy down here. Isn't that cute? Just a little tiny sunflower. Sometimes nature puts the most beautiful things in the most curious of places. Or as I once read somewhere, nature hides things, nature hides things by placing them in plain sight. <laughs>